his last week, his final week of life on earth, and how he chose to be with God's people, um, even over being with his mom and his brothers. We saw that Christ, even though he knew he was going to die, did not go and hide himself, but he actually went and rode as king. In fact, on Palm Sunday, we, we didn't do it on Palm Sunday, but we did it a few weeks prior to that, but we looked at the whole issue of Palm Sunday and how Christ rode as king into Jerusalem. And literally he was declaring war on the religious people of his day. And he was coming in and he was rubbing it right in their face. They couldn't get away from him because his time had come to die. I want you to understand if you're here this morning and you are not used to going to church, we're kind of a bit different church maybe than what you've been used to in the past. Um, We believe above everything else that the Bible is the Word of God. And we're completely and absolutely committed to that. And here we have the story of Christ. And when Christ went to the cross, I want you to understand that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, it was not an accident. It was not a good man who died a tragic death. It was God who came to earth with the very purpose of going to the cross. And it started right back in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned against God. When they sinned against God and God came and dealt with them in their sin, God said to Eve that from her a male child would come forth who would destroy the snake's head. And that was a direct reference to the cross of Jesus Christ where he would defeat Satan by his death. But in the process, his heel would be bruised, referencing to his physical death. And Satan certainly thought that he had won the victory. Three days ago, Jesus Christ hung on the cross. Three days ago, Jesus Christ was laid in a grave. Three days ago, the disciples thought, it's over, it's done. I love the song. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Now, I have to confess, when I first heard the song, I thought, how pathetic is that? You know, they're just living for the weekend. I didn't get it. And then all of a sudden, it just... I don't know if somebody explained it to me or whatever, but finally it it dawned on me. Friday, the death of Christ, everything looks hopeless. But Sunday is coming. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And today we are here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This morning we're talking about the empty grave. We're celebrating the physical resurrection of Christ from the grave. We're going to be looking at the fact, you know, you know, at the facts that declare this reality. That it happened. Sorry, we're going to look at the facts that declare that this really did happen and that it has uh, and that it has placed a call on our lives as followers of Christ. And so as we start, we're going to be looking at the empty grave. And let's just start with a word of prayer. Lord, we just come and I just pray that today, for anybody that's here who has not yet come to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, and maybe they've, they've come to church on Easter from time to time, and, and maybe they've even heard the claims of the, res- the resurrection, I pray that today you would reveal to them that they would understand and know that Jesus Christ truly is alive today. And that the grave truly is empty. And that sets Jesus Christ apart from all else. And I pray for those of us who know Christ, that we would be encouraged and strengthened and built up in the knowledge that today is Sunday. Today is the day we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And may we rejoice in that and live in the confidence of the resurrected Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. The grave, the empty grave sets Jesus apart. Jesus claimed that he would rise up from the grave. The first time he declared that was through, uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. 
And it was the fact that the people, the Pharisees and the teachers, so these are the religious people, they came to Jesus and they said, we want a miraculous sign from you. And he answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miracle, miraculous sign, but none will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. I don't know how familiar you are with the story of Jonah. But Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish. Not a whale, a huge fish. And so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then in Matthew 16, again the Pharisees, the second time come and ask Jesus, Pharisees and Sadducees, again they're religious, they say, show us a sign. We want to know, are you really from heaven? Are you really from God? And Jesus says, this wicked and adulterous generation, they look for a miraculous sign, but they're not going to be getting any except for one. The sign of Jonah. Jonah was three days in the belly of a fish. Some believe that he came out green. And that's why he was so effective when he went into Nineveh. I'm not sure what he looked like when he came out. I'm sure he was a bit of a mess, no matter what. But you know, here's the thing. When Jesus came forth out of the grave, he came out of the grave changed. He had a glorified body. It was the original body, but it was a glorified body. It was made new. He still had the scars. You could still see the scars in his hands. You could still see the scar in his side. It was not some mystical body. It was the body that he hung on the cross with. But it was made new. And he could walk through walls. What an interesting body. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. So Jesus said... I'm going to rise in three days. The sign of of Jonah. And then, of course, another time he speaks of his resurrection. And he says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 61. Actually, this is said about him. They said, uh, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And in Matthew 27, verse 40. You who are going to destroy the temple, again, spoken to Jesus as he's hanging on the cross, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Where did they get this from that Jesus said these words? Well, in John chapter 2, verse 19, and Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. And what was the Jewish response to that when Jesus said that? Could you imagine someone coming in here and saying, destroy this building, and in three days I'm going to build it up again? He'd say, you're nuts. It takes way longer than that just to paint the place. Right, Len? Because <laughs> Len's putting a lot of time here, painting. The Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it in three days? But then verse 21 tells us, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. His body. This temple. He said, if you destroy this temple, in three days I will come forth out of the grave again. After he was raised, verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. After Jesus came out of the grave, they remembered. He said he's going to come out of the grave. He told us. The disciples did not get Jesus' message at the time, but they did understand afterwards. Again, Jesus was not talking about Herod's temple, but he was talking about his body. And he was talking about the fact that he would come out of the grave in three days. And then you have Jesus speaking very plainly. Straightforward. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 63. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So now this is where the religious leaders have come to uh, Pilate. They said, we need guards standing at his grave to protect the grave, to make sure nobody comes and steals the body because this guy had said that he was going to come out of the grave in three days. They got it. 
In Mark 8, verse 2, we read, And I have compassion. Jesus is speaking here now. He says, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me for three days. And then verse 31, he said, And then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. Jesus is teaching this, folks, way before he goes to the cross. Jesus is teaching this way before the cross is even a thought with the other people. And Jesus is saying, the Son of Man must go. He must be rejected. He must be handed over. He must be killed. And then in three days, he will rise again. In Mark chapter 9, verse 31, again, Jesus teaches this. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. There's no question. It's part of God's plan that Jesus would go to the cross. It was not an accident. It was not a mistake. It was not God saying, oops, now what do I do? I sent my son into the world and I was expecting them to accept him and for him to set up a great kingdom and they were going to have a wonderful life but they killed him. That wasn't it. God sent Jesus Christ for this very purpose to go to the cross to die. They will kill him. And after three days he will rise. And then again in Mark chapter 10 verse 34 who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. Jesus speaking. Jesus didn't just hint at the idea, hoping that the disciples might get it. Jesus outright made the claim, and not just once, but throughout his ministry, that he was going to come forth out of the grave. Now, I want you to get this, folks. This is one reason why we cannot call Jesus a good teacher. We cannot call Jesus a good prophet. What teacher would you call good who made false claims? What teacher? I don't care who the person is. If the person makes false claims, are you going to continue to follow them? Are you going to say, that's a good person? That's a good teacher. Wow, what a great prophet. He lies through his teeth, but man, he's so good. You see, Jesus, if Jesus did not come forth out of the grave, then he is a liar and a fraud. You can't have it both ways. Either Jesus is in the grave and he is a liar and a fraud and what are we doing here? Let's go to Swiss Chalet. Really? Why be here? If Jesus is a liar and a fraud or the other reality is he told the truth and he's come forth out of the grave and then my question is why aren't you following him if you're here this morning and you've not yet received Christ as your savior why are you not following the one that came forth out of the grave why are you not throwing yourself on your face before him and pleading with him to be merciful to you you can't have it both ways You cannot say Jesus is a good man, he is a good teacher, he was a great prophet, if he did not also come forth out of the grave. Because he's either a liar, or he is the one who came forth out of the grave. grave. You see, Jesus' resurrection was physical and not just spiritual. Many today are moving in this concept that Jesus just simply came forth out of the grave spiritually. And I'm not even quite sure what their thinking is on that. But it's kind of the idea that, that the body was still there, but he came kind of back to life. But it was, it was kind of a, a spiritual form, a spirit of some sort. But the body was gone the body was gone. Luke chapter 23 verse 55 says the woman uh, the woman who had come with Jesus uh, from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. 
And then in chapter 24, verse 3, But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. But, and then in verse 23, But didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Again, to say that Jesus simply came forth spiritually and that his body is still in the grave is not true. The body was not there. They knew where he was laid. They went there the next day and the body was gone. So that of course raises the other question. Did the disciples simply steal the body? Did the disciples steal the body? Matthew chapter 27 verse 64 says, So give the orders for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. This is the religious people coming to Pilate saying, Please do this. Make it secure until the third day. So, you know, otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. And of course it would. It would be horrible. It would be horrible. If it was true, the disciples went and stole the body of Christ and then said that he was raised from the dead? That would be the greater deception. Matthew 28, verse 13. The religious leaders are talking now to the soldiers who had been set in charge to guard the tomb of Christ. And they're telling them, You are to say... So this is what the soldiers are to say when asked about what happened at the grave of Christ. His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now again, if the disciples came and stole the body of Christ away, that would be a pretty good ploy. But would you die for a lie just to keep it alive? All the disciples died. Some of them died horrible deaths. Because they believed that Jesus Christ came forth from the grave. Many people throughout the history, the last 2,000 years, have died because they believe that Jesus forth came out of the grave. Many people in our day and age, today, in this world, right now, are in prison, are being beaten are being killed because they believe that Jesus Christ came forth out of the grave. Would you die for a lie? The body is gone and the disciples do not know where it is. In John chapter 20 verse 13 and they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she says, they have taken my Lord away. She said, and I don't know where they have put him. So this woman comes to the grave and the grave, the stone is open. And the grave is there and she comes in and she sees that the body of Christ is gone and she is weeping. And again the question, verse 15, woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And thinking that he, that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. They loved Jesus Christ. They loved him. And they wanted to take care of his body. Who here, when someone of your family dies, someone whom you love, will you just discard the body? Would you treat the body with disrespect? No, we would not do that. We would treat it with respect because we love that person. She was looking for the body of Christ. And as far as she was concerned, someone had taken it away. Why would she even be in the grave where Jesus was laid if the disciples had taken the body she would have been attending the body of Christ in a new hiding place. That's where she would have been. She wouldn't have been at the old grave if the body had been stolen and the disciples had taken her. Then she would have been where they now had the body of Christ, attending the body of Christ, making sure he was cared for properly. Why would she be talking to the gardener if they had taken the body? 
she would not have wanted to be identified as one of Christ's disciples, lest the authorities could say, see, they did come and steal the body. And here's the kicker. Why would the religious leaders have to convince the soldiers to propagate this lie if it was true that the disciples came and stole the body of Christ? Why? Again, Matthew 28, when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. And uh, if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. You see, if this was true, the disciples had actually come and stolen the body of Christ, these soldiers would have told a different story. Because to tell the story that they were sleeping on the job? Like, come on. That's, there's no glory in that. They would have told the story more like this. You know, there were hundreds, there were thousands of these people and they came upon us and we couldn't do anything else but get out of there and save our own lives. And they came and they stole the body. Embellish it. If you want to embellish it, that's how they would have done it. They would not have told the story about them falling asleep and some weak guys coming who barely can even wield a sword. All they could do is chop off a guy's ear and here they come and they're going to steal the body. They're going to come against soldiers who are well trained at night in the dark to steal what? A dead body. When they didn't even know that he was going to come forth out of the grave until he did. Do you understand how ridiculous that was? Why would the religious leaders pay the soldiers if it was true? If it was true the disciples had come and stolen the body, the soldiers would not have needed to be paid. The empty grave is not fiction. Eyewitness accounts. The women saw the empty tomb. Matthew chapter 28, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, come see the place where he was lying. And when they go and they look, there's nothing there. The grave was empty. His body was no longer there. And the, the angels that are speaking to them say, Come and look and come and see and investigate for yourself that the tomb is empty. And then we have the disciples saw the empty tomb in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. And I like that. Here you have the two disciples. You've got John and Peter. And they're rushing because the women have come and they've told them, Listen, the tomb is empty. We don't know what happened, but his body's not there. And they come and they find the disciples who are hiding because they're terrified. They don't even know what's going on now. And so they're there. They're thinking, all of our hope is gone. The one whom we were trusting to set up his great kingdom, he got crucified. We don't even know what we're going to do. Eventually they say, well, let's go back fishing because that's all we know what to do anyways. And they're up there in the upper room. They're kind of trying to figure out what they're going to do. And the women come in and they tell them this very weird story about the fact that the body of Christ is no longer in the grave and that they were told by some shining thing that he was risen from the dead. And so what do they do? They run to the tomb. And John, being a little bit more fit than Peter, gets there first. And John looks in. You know why John looks in? Because for a Jew to go into a tomb, becomes, he, becomes he becomes defiled. He doesn't want to go in there. Especially not at this time when it's the Passover and all of the feasts and all that. But Peter being Peter, <laughs> he just runs right in. And he sees that the tomb is empty. There's just the cloth there. There is no body. The body had been wrapped and the body's gone but the cloth is still there and the cloth that was on his face has been neatly packaged up and put aside isn't that interesting 
the tomb is empty. They saw that the grave was empty. And then in John chapter 20, verse 16, the woman saw the risen Lord. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend it to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Here Mary sees Jesus. She was at the tomb. She was weeping. Where have they placed him? Where have they placed him? And then Christ is there. And she doesn't recognize him. And he speaks to her, and then she recognizes him, and now she grabs hold of him. I want you to understand again, that is such a significant picture for us. She grabs hold of him, and he says, you've got to let go of me. You cannot grab hold of a spirit. But you can grab hold of a physical body. And Jesus Christ came forth out of the grave physically. And I'm going to harp on that probably all morning this morning because I want you to understand that that is one of the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith. The disciples saw the risen Lord as well. In John chapter 20, verse 19, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, just a little comment there, that's why we come together on the first day of the week. Sunday is the day of worship. Sunday, every Sunday is resurrection day. Every Sunday is a reminder of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we come together on Sunday, the first day of the week. And they were gathered the first day of the week. And when the doors were shut, when the disciples were, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, they were hiding, they were terrified. If they could crucify Jesus, what could they do to us? And Jesus came in and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. The disciples see Jesus as he comes into their midst. Now they have several encounters. Another week later, the next Sunday, because Thomas wasn't there this time. And Thomas, when he was told that Jesus was come forth out of the grave and they'd seen him and he was in their midst, he says, I don't know, I'm not sure. Not unless I can put my hand in his hand and where the scars are and I can put my hand in his side and feel the scar, then I'll believe. And so the week later, Jesus comes in and he says, Okay, Thomas, here's the opportunity. Here I am, physically standing before you. Come and put your fingers in my hand and feel the scar. Know that it's me. Come and put your hand in my side. Know that it's me. And what does Thomas do at that point? He says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. The disciples had several encounters with Christ. One time, Christ meets them at the sea of Galilee and there they have fish together breakfast we'll talk a little bit more about that we're told in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6 that over 500 people saw the risen Lord this is most likely at the time of the ascension of Christ into heaven but we're not really told when it was but when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church for the, for the uh, first Corinthians, he says many of these eyewitnesses are still alive at that time. Many people, 500 people had seen the risen Lord. Now, we could, uh, we could surmise and say, you know what, you had the 12 and a few of the women that were there. They were very close to Jesus. They wanted to see the risen Jesus. They really wanted to see him. And so they just kind of imagined that they saw him. But when you have a crowd of 500 people who saw the physical, resurrected Jesus Christ in the flesh... I'm telling you, you go to any court and you say, I got witness number one and I got witness number two and I got witness number 300 and I got witness number 500. I'm sure by the time you got to 250, the judge would say, you know what? I don't need any more. And yet we live in a world today where there's so many people who want to deny the physical resurrection of Christ, even those who call themselves religious. What a shame. Because we have the witness of eyewitnesses who saw the the resurrected Lord. There were the 
ordinary occurrences. Jesus ate fish in John 21, verse 15. Jesus had breakfast with his disciples. This would have been a normal occurrence, except for the fact that, of course, Jesus had come forth out of the grave. So it was not quite normal. Jesus walked with them. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 30. Jesus joined these two guys. They're walking on the road to Emmaus. And as they're walking along, Jesus just simply comes and walks up beside them. He doesn't float down from the sky. He doesn't kind of zoom in. He just kind of walks up to them, the normal occurrence. And he starts to have a conversation with them. Jesus talked with them. Again, in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 30, he starts with the obvious. What are you guys talking about? These guys say, what? Haven't you heard? Haven't you heard about all the events that have taken place in Jerusalem? And then Jesus opens the word of God for them and explains what the Old Testament taught about how he had to die and rise on the third day. And then they invite Jesus to their place. They say, you know, and then this is a common occurrence in those days. If you were traveling along the road, there were no hotels. And so if it was nighttime, it was the right thing for you to be hospitable and say, why don't you come and stay at my house tonight? Because you definitely want to stay out in the streets. And so they invite Jesus to come in. And Jesus accepted their invitation. Again, a very common occurrence. Then there's the supernatural occurrences. Of course, Jesus entering a locked room. We've already read about that. You know, Jesus enters a locked room. The disciples are there. He does that twice. This is an amazing body that Jesus has. He can eat fish. He bears the scars from the crucifixion. He can be touched. He can be held. But he can walk through walls. We are told that someday in the resurrection we will have a body like that as well. And I think I'm going to have some fun with that. Romans 6 verse 5 speaks of that. Jesus could also hide his true identity. Sorry. I guess it's time to close off, isn't it? My voice is telling me that. Jesus could hide his true identity um, until he chose to reveal it. Again, we see that in Luke chapter 24. The guys could not recognize him at first, but only after Jesus taught them all that he wanted to teach them. And then he broke the bread. And at that point, they recognized him. And then Jesus could just disappear. Just disappear. I mean, here you are. He's sitting with them at the table. And he breaks the bread. And they recognize him. And then he's gone. Just like that. Supernatural occurrences. And i got to be closing off here. But the empty grave places a call upon our lives. In two areas. One is a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. You see, through Christ we are made new. This starts with coming to that place in life where we put our trust in Jesus Christ alone for our Savior. If you've not yet done that, then you are not a new creation. You are still the old, born in sin, separated from God, doomed for hell. Each and every one of us was born that way. I was born that way. But by the grace and the mercy of God, one day, as God revealed himself to me, I came to the place where I came to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. And on that day, I became a new creation in Christ. Jesus calls that being born again. John chapter 3, verse 3. What does it mean to be a new creation? Well, it means that we cannot live like we used to. We must live for Christ. Paul says, I am under obligation in Romans 1 verse 14. And then Paul says that we are all, all of us who are in Christ, are under obligation to live for Christ. Romans 8 verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. We're not to live like we used to live. If you're here this morning and you are a new creation, you are called by God to not live as you used to live. 
Are you living as a new creation, seeking to live for Christ, seeking daily to honor Jesus in all you do, doing all you can to fight temptation? Again, temptation is not sin. We all go through temptation. Jesus went through temptation. But it's when we give in to temptation that sin occurs. And by the grace of God, we need to fight that. We are raised to a new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6 speaks of that. Paul says, We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him uh, like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. And he goes on to talk about that. Again, simply in baptism, we declare that we've died with Christ. When we had a baptism here not that long ago, when the person goes down under the water, they were declaring. It didn't happen there. It happened when they came to faith in Christ. But in baptism, we declare that we have died and we've been buried with Christ. And in baptism, when we come forth out of the water, we are declaring that we've been raised to a new life. Again, that's why it's not for babies. It's for people who have come to faith in Christ. People who have died to self and are seeking to follow Christ. That's why it's also by immersion, not sprinkling or by pouring, because it is a representation of of being buried and coming forth out of the grave. If you have publicly been united with Christ in his death and declared that through baptism... You know, then the challenge is simply this, that you must also publicly be united with Christ in his, resur- in his resurrection to a new life. You must publicly be living that way, not just waiting for heaven. The resurrection is not just about after death. The resurrection is to a new life here and now. Jesus refers to that as the abundant life that he offers to us. So how do you end a sermon like this on Easter? Well, I believe that the best thing I can do is ask you simply one closing question. And there's three possible responses, I guess. And the question is, what will you do with the risen Savior? What will you do with Him? Will you reject Him? The one who went to the cross for you and came forth out of the grave, the only one that ever did that? Will you reject Him? Will you respect him? The religious response. Oh, he is a great teacher. He is a marvelous man. Or will you live in honor of him all the days of your life? Christ is risen. Let's pray. Lord, we just come and we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've come forth out of the grave. That this is not fiction. This is real. That we know this, not just from your word. We know this from your spirit that lives within us as well. And I pray, Lord, for any that are here who have not yet come to receive Christ, that this Easter would be the day when the Son of God would rise in their hearts and they would surrender their life to you, I pray. And I pray that you'd be with us who know you, that we would go from this place living in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to join us downstairs for a cup of coffee.